Hello everyone and welcome back to Understanding Existentialism. My name is Mark Thorsby and today we're going to be talking about uh, the first chapter of this book, Being in Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre. So welcome back everyone. Uh, this is our second text in the series we've looked at by Sartre. This is the first major text though. And to be honest, it's quite a difficult text, at least in terms of the way in which it's written and in terms of the references it has. My goal today is going to be to articulate what some of the key concepts are from this first chapter. Now, a little bit about Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, for a couple of things, he lived from 1905 to 1980. Um, he's in a very important French uh, literary figure as well as a philosopher from really the early part of the 20th century. His first major work um, in 1938 was Nausea, uh, which is basically a book which is going to, um, which in many ways exemplifies a key concepts we're going to discuss today, which includes the concept of anguish within existentialism. His next major and probably his most important work in existentialism is this book, Being in Nothingness, from 1943. Um, uh, in 1946, he published Existentialism is a Humanism, for which he is well known. We've read it. And that was the text where he identified the definition of existentialism as essentially being the idea that existence precedes essence. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, he has a great play from 1947 called No Exit. It's a great play in which people die and go to hell, and they're waiting to get tortured until they realize that hell is other people. Uh, in 1960, he takes a somewhat of a turn, uh, I would say away from existentialism, but towards Marxism. And he publishes his next major work in philosophy called A Critique of Dialectical Reason, which we're not going to really discuss in this video or the video series that I'm doing. Um, also, just I'll mention, in 1964, he was nominated to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature, which he declined. Um, so one of the few people to decline such a prestigious award and he did so on the basis of trying to maintain his own authenticity um, so and that's something we'll talk about a little bit more in our next video on bad faith um, so I'm going to start off here with just a couple key points from the introduction to this book um, and I'm going to keep these fairly brief um, the there was a pretty sizable introduction called the pursuit of being in um uh, at the beginning of this book. This video today, we're really just going to focus on chapter one, but I will sort of start off with some of the key points that he makes within this introduction. The first thing here is that the starting point for his discussion in Being in Nothingness is the starting point of consciousness. And he really starts off from Husserl. And to be clear, he references both Husserl and Heidegger significantly. Um, in fact, we know that... Um, for instance, Heidegger, the version of Heidegger that Sartre read was the, uh, the, the version published of Being in Time, translated into French by Emmanuel Levinas, who's a philosopher we're going to look at later on in the series here. But it starts off with this problem of consciousness. And remember, the key fundamental point of phenomenology was intentionality, and that's the notion that, that all consciousness is always consciousness of something. And that means that consciousness is positional. Consciousness, whenever we're conscious of anything in the world, we, as it were, take a certain position towards the world. Um, and we can also make a distinction of exi in existence that's going to become important throughout this book. And that's the distinction between being in itself versus being for itself. Now, we can't really talk too much about being for itself yet. But being in itself is this fundamental notion that goes back to philosophy for a long time which is the notion of things, how they exist fundamentally, regardless of how they're perceived, uh, what Kant called the noumenal realm. But we're going to see here that Sartre is not picking up from Kant at all. Uh, and he's going to say, he's going to pick up from Husserl, this notion of consciousness, and then try to think about what that reveals for existence. Now, in our previous videos, we've learned that Husserl's analysis of, of phenomenology, of consciousness, yielded um, ontological results. That is, we're able to deduce fundamental structures of the way in which um, our being exists based upon the way in which it interprets 
um, phenomena in consciousness. So I won't go through all of that, uh, but there's an, a key important point of that. So first off, the consciousness of consciousness. Now, compass, the consciousness of an object is what we call positional. So I have a coffee cup here and I'm conscious of it, which means that I take a position to it. But the consciousness of consciousness itself is, as it were, something which is, if you will, a priori or transcendental to my consciousness of an object. And it is non-positional. Now, Sartre states that every positional consciousness of an object is at the same time a non-positional consciousness of itself. So that means that I'm both aware of the world when I'm seeing it, but I'm also aware of myself within the world. And he gives the example of counting cigarettes. He says, I open up and I look and count my cigarettes. In that moment, I'm conscious of the cigarettes and I take a position, but I'm also conscious of myself counting them. Hence, when I count them and I realize that there's less cigarettes than I thought there were, um, I'm able to, as it were, recognize the non-positional nature of my consciousness. So that means he says there's a pre-reflective cogito. And cogito, we can think of here as just Descartes' term for the subjective consciousness. There's a pre-reflective cogito, which is the condition of the Cartesian cogito. Now remember, the Cartesian cogito is the I think, therefore I am that comes from the philosopher René Descartes. And that's a very important thing, right? He says that I think while I'm thinking, I must be existing. That's what Descartes argued. But notice there that that is a consciousness that has an object. So there's something even more fundamental to that type of consciousness, which is ultimately what the consciousness of consciousness is. So this pre-consciousness, importantly, is a mode of existence, Sartre tells us. And what Sartre's trying to overcome is, quote, the illusion of the theoretical primacy of knowledge. In fact, what Sartre takes great pains to talk about in the introduction is the notion that the analysis of consciousness is not just an analysis of our knowledge of the world or our knowledge of consciousness. There's something ontological to this. So if we were to put it maybe plainly, we could say that for Sartre, the question of consciousness is not an epistemological issue. It's an ontological issue. It's a question about being. In, in this section, he gives the example of pleasure. He says, for instance, pleasure is not the consciousness we have of it, right? Consciousness is rather a mode. I'm sorry, pleasure is a mode in consciousness. He says, it's impossible to assign to consciousness a motivation other than itself. And we'll see that's pretty important. So consciousness is the plenum of existence. And this determination of itself by itself is an essential characteristic of consciousness. Now, consciousness is prior to nothingness and is derived from being. So passive consciousness, that is consciousness that doesn't have an active role in seeing and inspecting the world, is really something which is unthinkable for us. An existing, it would be an existing consciousness which doesn't per perpetuate itself. Whereas you and I, when we're conscious of the world, whether they be coffee cups, computers, or books, right? I'm perpetuating my consciousness in the sense that I'm intentionally directing it towards more and more things. But that's an activity, it's not passivity. So consciousness has nothing substantial in the sense that it's not an object, it's rather a pure appearance in the sense that it exists only to the degree to which it appears, right? The only way I can be conscious of consciousness is not to grasp a substance or an object, but is rather to recognize um, it in terms of appearance. And that's all it seems to be. And this is going to become important for Sartre because he's going to use this notion of phenomenology, which is the study and analysis of consciousness. And since consciousness is an appearance, in order to essentially get out of the problem of the inner and the outer and the mind and the world in the various dualisms that we see in modern philosophy. And he discusses that quite a bit in this introduction. And again, I'm just kind of going through this briefly just to give you something on the back end and for the background that is. Now, importantly, he says existentialism is not a form of idealism, right? He says, quote, there is no longer the subject in Kant's meaning of the term, but it is subjectivity itself, the imminence of self, in self. So he's not adopting um, the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant or the idealism of Hegel or who, whomever. He doesn't want to think of existentialism as essentially just looking at ideality and, and denying the reality of the world, right? 
Instead, the conscious self reveals the structure of being. And so in many ways, Sartre follows in the path or in the footsteps of Descartes, and he's going to analyze the question of existence by looking at the way in which consciousness is a form of our existence, or rather the form of our existence. Now notice here that although consciousness is active, perception is passive. Now what is passivity? Well, I'm passive when I undergo a modification of which I am not the origin. So for instance, when I drink this coffee, I taste something, I perceive a taste, but that taste is not something which I am the origin of, and I can't change the flavor of it just by thinking about it. So I'm a passive, I'm the, on the passive end, as it were, and that's what perception is. Passivity is a doubly relative phenomena. It, that is, it has two forms of relation. It's relative to the activity of the one who acts, and it's relative to the existence of the one who suffers. Um, and so you're going to see here as we go through and being in nothingness, Sartre is going to introduce, and you'll see many of the other philosophers like Heidegger did the same. He's going to introduce a new lexicon for thinking about the subject. And we're going to see that it's a bit dark, including this notion of suffering. So that's something that's on the foreground here. Now, he does talk a little bit about something called the ontological proof. And remember, the ontological proof refers to two very famous arguments for God's existence, one of them by St. Anselm in the Middle Ages, and the other by Rene Descartes in his Meditations on First Philosophy. Now, the goal of the ontological proof was to argue that God exists by the nature of God's existence. In other words, if God's essence included perfection, or uh, absolute uh, unlimited greatness, then that meant that existence had to be part of God's essence. Now, this is going to become important for us because when he talks about the quote-unquote ontological proof in this context, he's going to be thinking about the ontological proof of the way in which essence and existence are related for us, right? So keep in mind here that consciousness is consciousness of something. That's the notion of intentionality, the directionality of consciousness. And that means that consciousness is a form of being. Thus, the object of consciousness is not being, but absence or nothingness. Now think about this. That means that while I'm conscious, conscious of things, my consciousness is a form of being, which means that the passivity of what I'm perceiving is not being because it's different from myself. And that means that it has to be absence or nothingness. And you may be sitting here thinking, well, what does that mean? That doesn't make sense. When I perceive the coffee cup, it certainly looks like the coffee cup is not nothingness. Well, we're gonna unlock that today because we're gonna be looking at the first chapter where he talks about negation and he talks about nothingness. And we're gonna see that every act of consciousness, even though it's a form of our being, operates through what we call negation or it operates by as it were introducing nothingness into our the stream of our consciousness if you will now he's going to say that our intentions aim at appearances which are never given at one time so when i'm looking at the coffee cup i see an appearance but then i can't see the appearance over here i look over here at my hand i see that appearance but notice that none of these appearances are ever given simultaneously Thus, the being of the object is pure non-being. I don't actually perceive the object in its pure being. I rather understand it by what it's not. So it gets defined by a lack, by an absence. And it is that which escapes, that which by definition will never be given, that which offers itself only in fleeting and successive profiles. So my knowledge of the coffee, shop, coffee cup is only given by me rotating it and recognizing different adumbrations of that perception. So whenever I see one, I also don't see the others, right? Um, so it's given news through these successive profiles. So consciousness is consciousness of something, and this means that the transcendence is the constitutive structure of consciousness. That is that consciousness is born supported by a being which is not itself. Now, this is what he calls or what we can call the ontological proof. Now, what exactly does that all mean? Hopefully, by the end of today's video, we'll have a much better sense of what that means. Now, this, he, he goes on to say in the introduction, quote, This we have left pure appearance and have arrived at full being. 
Consciousness is a being whose existence posits its essence. And inversely, it is consciousness of a being whose essence implies its existence. That is, in which appearance lays claim to being. Being is everywhere, he says. Now, this is very sort of cryptic, uh, but he's sort of alluding, I started as alluding to here, to ultimately what he's going to try to uncover. And you're going to see that in the beginning of this first chapter, Sartre's work is somewhat opaque, but by the end, it really yields a really powerful and interesting set of concepts. Now, finally, he makes a couple remarks about being in itself. Now, so far, we can talk about two forms of being, the being of this pre-reflective cogito, and also the being of the phenomena. So there's the being of consciousness, of which... Uh, which is organized, which is somehow involved in my awareness of the world. And there's the being of the things that I actually experience in the phenomena, right? Um, so being though is itself, right? Being just is. Being by being taken apart from any particular appearance is not activity or passivity. Being, he said, is beyond negation and affirmation. Being is opaque to itself. Think about this. Everything that you're experiencing, both this video, me, yourself, all of these things, right, have being. They all are existing in some sort of way. But in the but if everything you're experiencing has being, then in what sense can you actually give a, deter, a characteristic of being in itself? Being is opaque. It's very difficult to pin down. Now, and we know that being is not nothingness, obviously. Nothingness is the denial of being. So being is a, con there's a contingent principle of being in itself. But when we say being in itself, we don't mean inner versus outer in the sense of the inner subjective and the outer material. Being in itself is, as it were, being in both ways, right? Both the pre-reflective cogito as well as the being of the phenomena. He gives this a sort of description where he says, being in itself is solid, right? In some sort of way, being in itself has reality um, and sort of solidity. So, but I think this term solid that he uses, I don't think he's arguing that to be, have being, you have to be solid because the consciousness is not solid, but somehow it is concrete. And we're gonna see Sartre explore the language of the concrete as we go forward. Being in itself though is full pos positivity. It's not subject to temporality. Notice that whatever it is that being in itself is, it has no nothingness because it's existence. So it's full positivity. It's not negative. But in the sense that all things, even though we experience beings with the lowercase b in time, being in itself is not subject to temporality. Think about here the notion that, um, what is it? Um, you can never really destroy energy. It just gets displaced and moved around, right? That means that in a certain way, even though everything is changing in the universe, the existence of the universe as such is not subject to temporality. Um, being is, being is in itself, and finally being is what it is. And these are three determinations that Sartre gives at the end of the introduction. Now, they're quite cryptic, but... As we know from our discussion of Martin Heidegger's being in time, the question of being, or in Heidegger's terminology, the Seinsfrage, is extremely uh, difficult and opaque. So don't feel bad or weird if you're struggling to make sense of this concept and this discussion of being. It's precisely why this book is so large. Um, so we're just here at the very beginning of it. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Based on those basic preliminaries, we're going to jump into a discussion of the first chapter of being, nothing, being Nothingness. Now, this book has different parts. This is part one, The Problem of Nothingness. And the name of this is chapter one, The Origin of Negation. Now, the chapter is composed of five sections. The first he calls the question. Second is negations. Third, he discusses the dialectical concept of nothingness, really thinking about Hegel. And then he moves to Husserl in the phenomenological concept of nothingness. And then finally, the most important section of the entire chapter, the origin of nothingness. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to walk through these five major elements uh, that Sartre develops and organizes his discussion with. Now, before we get going, remember and keep in mind that the question of being in nothingness 
is a question that goes back to the most ancient of philosophers. Um, the philosopher Parmenides, for instance, argued that what is, is, and what is not, is not. And from that, Parmenides concluded that all, anything we experience that includes negation must be an illusion. That meant that he denied there was such a thing as time. He denied that there was such a thing as space or difference or motion. Because ultimately, all of these aspects, whether it's time, motion, or even our identity, all in some way involve an assumption of nothingness. And so for in the ancient world, Parmenides denied this, and he's famous for arguing for monism. You've probably heard of Zeno's paradoxes. Um, and then of course, this became important for eventually the work of Plato and others, right? So start here in terms of going to the problem of nothingness and being is really um, touching upon, I think, a subject in philosophy that we really see prominently discussed in the pre-Socratic philosophers. And that like, I think, Heidegger's analysis reveals, it's a problem that we're returning to again in order to make better sense of ourselves and the way in which, and the meaning of our own existence and the meaning of our own being in the world. Um, and of course, he's starting here with the problem of consciousness. So let's jump into it here. Now, the question. Now, when we talk about the question, notice that the question here is, is what we're asking. What is the meaning of being, right? Now, who, what connects these two regions of being, this pre-reflective being of consciousness and the being of phenomena? Now, Sartre says that another way of asking this is to ask, what is the synthetic relationship which we call being in the world? And Sartre's not lost. It's not lost on Sartre that this is fundamentally a Heideggerian conception. And in Heidegger, we saw the important notion that Dasein is always already a being in the world. And this is fundamental for Sartre's thinking as well. When we begin by asking ourselves who we are, we can't start off with the notion that we're just minds or brains, you know, minds somewhere, you know, in the world and we're making sense and we're just these um, purely subjective souls or something. No, instead we have to recognize that we are beings that are intimately involved in the world. And to ask a question is itself a type of that involvement. So we have to be careful here, and we have to adopt a similar stance to Heidegger's as we approach this question. And number two, we can ask, what must, or start ask, what must man and the world be in order for their relation between them to be possible? Now we know that human beings obviously are beings, and the world is composed of beings. So obviously there's a way in which we are be we have being just like everything else. But what does it mean that we have a relationship as being beings that are in the world and intimately involved in it? Notice that my relationship to other beings like this book is to use them. That's There's a synthetic relationship between my being and my use of this object. What makes that possible? We're going to see that consciousness is an essential ingredient. And, with, and the central ingredient of consciousness will be negation. So we're going to begin with the simple question itself. When we ask a question, well, it is a what is a question? It's a human attitude that's filled with meaning. Okay, so every question can get um, a response that's either an affirmation of some sort or a negation. So there's a way in which every question has this sort of du duality to it, if you will. He writes, thus the question is a bridge set it between two non-beings, the non-being of knowing in man and the possibility of non-being, of being in transcendental being. So truth, he says, introduces a third non-being, the non-being of limitation. Non-being, uh, uh, Sartre argues, is a component of the real. Now, this is sort of opaque and difficult, I think, to somewhat understand. But first off, notice here, let's start with this third comment, that non-being is a component of the real. Notice that when I look into the world and I say, I, like you can't see, but I, right above my screen here is a window and I can see a tree, right? I can see that tree and I can see it's a tree precisely because I recognize that it is not the house that's next to it or the pool that's next to it or the fence that's next to it. So that means that my ability to conceive of 
the tree as being a real entity in the world is contingent upon my also recognizing the non-being of the tree, what the tree is not. And when we ask a question, we are essentially playing within this field of non-being. On the one hand, he says there's the non-being of knowing, like I don't have the knowledge, that's why I asked the question. But there's also the possibility of the non-being of being in the transcendental being. In other words, there's possibility of the negation of my question. And when I touch upon the truth, then that means I've discovered something. But, but even that discovery of the truth has a limitation which defines it as the truth. So non-being is, as it were, what just even asking a question wraps us up in three different ways into this conception of nothingness. And so you can see right from the beginning to just ask a question is to beg the question of negation. So that brings us to section two, negations. Now, negation proper in classical philosophy, we're told is unthinkable, right? And he gives the example when I look into my wallet and I look and I think I have, I think he says 1,500 francs, but I only have 1,300. When I recognize that I don't have enough money, right, then that means I'm recognizing that something is not there, right? Or in other words, I'm recognizing that there's nothingness in the place of the 1,500 francs. There's only 1,300 or whatnot. So in the classical philosophy, negation fundamentally seems to be an unthinkable kind of thing. We're going to see Sartre flip that on its head and in fact argue, um, not explicitly but implicitly, that uh, the very fact that anything is thinkable implies negation. Now notice he says that we, he talks about the copula. And the copula, it just refers to the word is or is not in classical logic, right? If I say all men are mortal, the word are is a copula. Um, and think about this. Think about the way in which we use the word is in virtually every sentence. Like I say, the sun is uh, shining, right? Or I say the green is grass. Or I say the rain, it is not raining, right? Notice there, the word is is fundamental to the way in which we relate subjects and predicates in language or is not. Your copulas can either be affirmative or negative, right? Um, but notice, so notice here is that our human language fundamentally relies upon a conception of being and negation. It seems that nothingness should only be a mode of judgment about phenomena and that nothingness is not. But should we accept this, Sartre asked. Well, Sartre gives the ex well. Sartre was going to say this to start. He's going to say, "Quote: Is negation as the structure of the ju um, judicative proposition at the origin of nothingness, or on the contrary, is nothingness as the structure of the real the origin and foundation of negation?" So the question here is: Is negation really just my judgment about the way the things are? So, for instance, I look at the coffee cup and realize this coffee cup is not a uh, teddy bear right <laughs> now is that that obviously i'm making a judgment when i say that when i make the proposition this is not a teddy bear and i'm using that copula is not um, but is uh is that is the origin of that coming from just language or does it come from the structure of the real what is the foundation of negation negation he says appears on the original basis of the relationship of man to the world. He's going to argue that negation seems to be extraordinarily fundamental to our awareness of ourselves and the world. And every time we have any awareness, there is always negation somewhere around, right? Negation, he's going to argue, is not the quality of a judgment. It's something more fundamental. And he gives the example of fixing a car. So I've got a picture of here of someone fixing a car. And for instance, when you fix a car and you're trying to track down and differentiate what did or did not cause a breakdown, you're looking at the carburetor or you're looking at the engine or the spark plugs or whatever it is, it's not a judgment that I'm interrogating about the world. Uh, it, right? But it's the world, in fact, that I'm interrogating with an expectation that either being or non-being will be revealed. So for instance, in this picture, we have this gentleman who looks like he's fixing a tire or changing a tire or something. We don't know. Let's say he doesn't know. He's trying to figure out what's wrong with his tires or his braking system. So it's not a judgment that he's interrogating. He's trying to affirm or deny. 
it's actually what's in the world that's being negated, right? It is the our carburetor, it is not the carburetor, it is the brake line, it is not the brake line, etc. Right? So it's the world that gets interrogated, and it's my expectation of being or not being that gets revealed about the world. Now, what this reveals for Sartre is it reveals what we might call the fragility of being. The notion that being is fragile. What does that mean? Well, a being is fragile if it carries in its being a definite possibility of non-being, right? So a being is fragile if it can, can potentially not be a being, right? And that's true for all of us in the sense that we're all going to die. Um, so I'm a being right now, I'm living in the world, but at some point in the, in the future, I will lose my existence. So I'm, I'm fragile in the sense that I carry along in my own existence the definite possibility of non-being. And we're gonna see it goes even further than that because it's gonna relate ultimately to the non-being that's possible in consciousness. Now, fragility amounts to a permanent possibility of non-being. Thus it is man, he says, who renders cities destructible precisely because he posits them as fragile and as precious and because he adopts a system of protective measures with regard to them. Now, this is pre precisely related to uh, the non-being in consciousness. So when I, I think about this, when I see something that's fragile, let's go with my coffee cup, I can drop this cup and it would shatter, right? And when I recognize that fragile, when I recognize that it can be broken, then that means I recognize that the being is fragile because it includes the possibility of non-being. But notice here is that if I drop this cup um, and it breaks, um, if my dog sees it, does my dog see it as something which is fragile? Um, I don't think so, right? Um, it looks like fragility in, has to do with my ability to negate it and to recognize that it can be destroyed. He writes, it is necessary to recognize that destruction is an essentially human thing. And this is man, and that it is man who destroys. So this is sort of interesting. Notice, think about this way. Um, in nature, everything is cyclical and nothing is destroyed. But everything that has to do with human, human reality can always be destroyed. So there's something fundamental, and it's not cyclical, right? Civilization doesn't just reemerge. We have to rebuild it. Um, so there's something very interesting about this idea um, that's, I think, worth uh, pondering over. Okay, negative judgments. Now, here's the question. Does a negative judgment cause non-being to appear at the heart of being or merely limit itself to determining a prior revelation, right? So, for instance, when I make a negative judgment and I say that it is not sunny outside, for instance, uh, then what exactly is going on, right? So in order to explore this, this question of making negative judgments, um, Sartre gives his most famous example of Pierre's absence in a cafe. And of course, this is a modern cafe. In fact, actually, it's a bar. Um, but I guess there's a coffee, there's a, a coffee maker there, so it's a cafe. Uh, but for instance, he gives the example of he goes to the cafe to, to meet a friend of his named Pierre. And when he goes to the cafe, even though it's bustling with people and there's, you know, drinks being made and there's people laughing, people smoking cigarettes, whatever it is, you can imagine a, you know, early 20th century uh, French cafe. And you're, he's looking for Pierre and he recognizes that Pierre is not in the cafe. So that's a negative judgment that gets made. Pierre's not in the cafe. But the question is, how is that exactly possible to make a negative judgment? And so Sartre's going to really explore this, right? You say, he's not here. Pierre's not here. What does this mean? Well, first off, take the notion that the cafe, with all of its elements, is actually a fullness of being, right? The cafe, everything in that cafe, 100% of it has existence. All of it has being, right? Um, the, from the waiters, uh, to the patrons, to the drinks, to the food, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So he says, quote, when I enter this cafe to search for Pierre, there's formed a synthetic organization of all the objects in the cafe, right? I scan the cafe and I see them all related to each other. The cafe, though, becomes the ground for my recognition of Pierre's absence. So it's like I see 
of the cafe and all of it has existence, all of it has being, but that being, all of it, its totality, becomes really the background for my ability to recognize that Pierre is absent. I, as it were, recognize the negation of Pierre on top of the fullness of being that is, uh, that is the cafe with all of its elements and characteristics. So the perception that Pierre is not there is annihilation, in which the cafe is a ground for an appearance of non-being. It's really kind of weird, but you can see how this makes sense. When you go and you, let's say you're looking for your keys and you can't find them, right? It's as it were, everything you're seeing has existence, but all of that becomes a background. He says ground, but I like background. It becomes a background for an appearance of my keys non-existence, or at least their non-being in that space. So back to Pierre, what we can say is that Pierre is absent from the whole cafe, not just one part of it, not just in one way, but Pierre is completely absent. Quote, this figure, which slips constantly between my look and the solid, real objects of the cafe, is precisely a perpetual disappearance. It is Pierre raising himself as nothingness on the ground of the annihilation of the cafe. I think it's quite beautiful and I think it's a great example um, for thinking about part of the mystery of our ability to intentionally direct ourselves to nothingness or to the absence of something. Um, so we have Pierre. Next here, Sartre recognizes that there's really two movements of this quote unquote annihilation. So when I'm a bill, when I have the, when I recognize that something is not the case, there's kind of two things going on. On the one, I have the negation of the cafe as ground. And on the other hand, I have the negation of Pierre. So I see the cafe, but I negate the cafe. But then there's the negation of Pierre as well, who's completely absent from the cafe. And Sartre says, but to be exact, I myself expected to see Pierre, and my expectation has caused the absence of Pierre to happen as a real event concerning the cafe. It's an objective fact at present that I've discovered this absence, and it presents itself as a synthetic relationship between Pierre and the setting in which I'm looking for him. Pierre's absence haunts the cafe. Now, it's sort of interesting, right? It's true. Um, we like to think of facts as being the totality of beings, but notice here is we can have negative facts. So it can be a fact that it is not raining, right? It can be a fact that Pierre is not in the cafe. And those facts are real events. But notice their reality is not um, based, or that reality is annihilation, right? It is a nothingness, actually. But how can nothingness be a fact or be real when everything in the universe necessarily that exists has being? So you can see here, part of the problem we're running into is we have this, I would call it this uh, perplexing feature of consciousness in terms of, it, in terms of the way in which we recognize nothing or negation, but what is its origin? Uh, so I think that's really fascinating to think about. Now, he says negation is sort of a refusal of existence, right? The whole world, the cafe is populated with existing things, but to recognize Pierre is not there is to refuse that existence. And that's somewhat instructive because to refuse existence means there must be a refuser, which means the origin of negation must be somehow situated in the being who can refuse. And we'll see that here in a moment. Now, another thing here is notice that negation is an event. An event is the notion of something which comes about unexpectedly or without cause. Negation is, quote, an abrupt break in the continuity which cannot in any case result from prior affirmations. It is an original and irreducible event. Here, we're in the realm of consciousness. Now, this is going to become important because Clearly, we know this from science, that the world of physical objects is organized by determinated causes and things like this. And that, strictly speaking, nothingness doesn't exist in the world. Nothingness is nothing. So what's going on here? It must mean that the event of negation, 
something which is uncaused because uh, existence can't cause nothingness, right? Nothingness is just nothing. So that means that we can only be talking about nothingness as it were within the realm of consciousness. Now, in this sec third section, which I'm going to go through somewhat quickly and not get into too much detail, he calls the dialect the, the dialectical concept of nothingness. And in many ways, what Sartre is doing here is he's referring to the phenomenology of Hegel in Hegel's di famous dialectic. Um, Hegel, you can just check out my other videos on Hegel, uh, but Hegel essentially was an idealist philosopher who argued that there was really a logic to the development of history and it had to do with the development of consciousness, essentially. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that. But there is a dialectical concept of nothingness. And in, in Hegel's uh, logic of science, uh, he argues that um, consciousness develops through the negation of negation. So negation is a critical concept within Hegel. Now, importantly, though, Hegel argued that nothingness and being are both so such abstract concepts that they don't really have any meaning. So we're going to see start really in this section talk about Hegel, but then kind of push him away and gravitate towards Husserl's conception of nothingness, and then eventually articulate really his own full throated sense of what nothingness is. So Hegel was the preeminent thinker of the dialectic, at least in modern philosophy. Now, <clears throat> this comes from section page forty five. Sartre says, this pure being, according to Hegel, or wrote Hegel, is pure abstraction and consequently absolute negation, which taken in its immediate moments is also non-being. Pure being and pure nothingness are the same thing, according to Hegel. Or rather, it's true to say that they're different, but as, as, they, uh, as here the difference is not yet a determined difference, for being and non-being constitute the immediate moment such as it is in them. This difference cannot be named. So notice here is that when you say that something has being, you're not talking about any characteristic, particular characteristic that it has, which means that you're looking at it, it's there's sort of, you have a, de a determined, you don't have a determined difference, right? And it's merely just immediate. The thing either it is or is not. And if it's not, that's also immediate. So that's such an abstraction that Hegel in many ways just argued that they're just abstract concepts that really originate from the similar source. Now, uh, for Hegel, being can be thought of as a thesis and non-being as the antithesis. And the ultimate, the dialectic was that you have a thesis and that thesis gets negated, but then the negation of the negation results in a synthesis, which becomes a new thesis. And Hegel's view is that this dialectic was the process by which consciousness would unfold. And ultimately, that, that concern, the affairs of human social life and the rest of it, and history itself. Um, take a look at, uh, for uh, the best introductory material on Hegel, read Hegel's own work, The Introduction to the History of Philosophy, uh, where he kind of goes over all of this. Um, so that means that nothingness haunts being. And Sartre says, being is prior to nothingness and establishes the ground for it. Nothingness, which is not, can have only a borrowed existence then. And it gets its being from being, right? And I should say it gets its being because nothingness doesn't exactly have any being, but somehow it's a feature of our being. So there's something going on here. And it's nothingness of being encountered only within the limits of being. So I never experienced pure nothingness. It's only, as it were, nothingness in the constituted context of uh, being. So being is always the fundamental thing here. Nothingness haunts being, um, as it were. Um, Non-being exists only, I like this, on the surface of being. So that's sort of interesting, right? Um, I think that's helpful. Now, from here, Sartre turns to the question of, or he turns to Husserl and really what he calls the phenomenological concept of nothingness. And he's also, also going to turn here to Heidegger as well. And it's a turn really, let's say, towards Heidegger's concept of nothingness to start. Being and non-being are empty abstractions. Nothingness is, nothingness is not, right? It truly is nothing. And it, it annihilates itself. So for Heidegger, man is a being of distances. Um, it, there's a concept that Heidegger has um, that we looked at previously called de-stantiation. 
uh, the way in which I can de-distantiate myself. The way in which I get close is actually a feature of distance. So and we're going to see here anguish really more at the end is the discovery of the double annihilation in consciousness. Okay, let me read this quote to you. In other words, there is, in other words, it is not as undifferentiated emptiness or as a disguised otherness that nothingness provides the ground of negation. Nothingness stands at the origin of the negative judgment because it itself, it is itself negation. It founds the negation as an act because it is the negation as being. Nothingness can be nothingness only by annihilating itself expressly as nothingness of the world. That is, in its annihilation, it or nothingness must direct itself expressly towards this world in order to constitute itself as a refusal of the world. Nothingness carries being in its heart. So when we talk about nothingness, nothingness is never, you can't say that nothingness is, just like Parmenides says, nothingness is not, or non-being is not. So, but there's all, the only way that nothingness can have any purchase then is by constant itself towards the world, but as a refusal of the world, right? Um, so there's this sort of weird thing that's going on. So in consciousness is as it were, nothingness is the feature which creates the distance between myself and the phenomena, between the pre-cogito and the um, cogito of my consciousness and the being of phenomena, right? So ultimately the distance I have is really predicated on this notion. Now, Sark gives this interesting example of negation in a line segment. So you can see here, you have a line and there's two dots, right? Between the ends of the line segment. Now notice that the two dots are part of the structure of negation because each dot negates one side of the line. And without that negation, it's not a line segment. So negation here is a secondary structure of the object. He writes, quote, the two points in the segment which is enclosed between them have the indissoluble unity of what the Germans call a gestalt. Now, a gestalt is when something is given not through one of its elements, but through its entire configuration. And the entire configuration of a line statement is only given through this, as it were, duality of negation between each point on either end of the statement. So he says negation is the cement which realizes this unity. So the unity of the line segment, this, the line segment as a line segment, is given ultimately through this duality, or I don't want to use the term duality, but through this gestalt of negation. Um, so that's sort of an interesting example. So what does that mean? It means that we're just looking at about negation in terms of line segments in Pierre, but you can see here that negation is the basis for an infinite number of human realities. Um, and they're realities because it's truly real facts about the world we're describing. We're not just talking, when I say it's not raining, it truly is not raining. Um, but notice here that negation is the basis of that. And it almost looks like, I would not almost, but it is, the fact that whenever I am conscious of something, I have intentionality. Remember, it's the directedness towards the directedness of consciousness. It is always a negation. So when I'm conscious of one thing, I'm negating everything else. When I'm conscious of another thing, I'm then negating everything else. So all of the different feature, features of human reality are given through this process of negation. So it's not just line segments, but quite literally everything that's real to us. Now, where does all of this come from? What is the origin of nothingness? And this is really the heart of the chapter and the most, I think, important part of the chapter and introduces the most interesting existential terms and so on and so forth. So what's the origin of nothingness? Well, Sartre begins with a brief review, right? He says, well, the question of being requires negation. Now we know that. We also see that negation refers to nothingness as its origin. Negation can't refer to being or somethingness because something can't create nothing and nothing can't create something. So negation only refers to nothingness by its origin. But what we also see is that what nothingness is not. Nothingness is not something outside of being because it's not a something at all. Nothingness is not a complement to being because it's not a something, right? It's the refusal of being. 
And he's going to argue even further, but nothingness is not just an abstract notion in the sense of, uh, of Hegel, right? Why? Because nothingness is a feature of the real. So nothingness also is not an infinite milieu where being is just suspended, where I'm just ignoring and parenthesizing being. Be nothingness is has a reality of some sort, right? What we do know is that being lacks all relationship to nothingness since it's full positivity, right? So being can't be related to nothingness. It's not like I can have um, the co the real coffee cup that has being in the coffee cup that has nothing. I can't relate those two things together because nothingness by definition is full negativity. And there can be no interaction between something that has being and something which is nothing. That doesn't make any sense. So where the heck does nothingness come from? The answer is it must come from a being that negates. It comes from the being that negates. It comes from us. So he's going to give this argument. He's going to say nothingness is not. But nothingness is made to be, right? Because I recognize it as a feature of the real, right? When Pierre is not there. But nothingness does not annihilate itself. Nothingness is annihilated, right? So it follows, therefore, Sartre argues, that there must exist a being of which the property is to annihilate nothingness, to support it in its being, to sustain it perpetually, in its very existence, a being which nothingness comes to things. Now, the being by which nothingness comes cannot remain indifferent to that production. It is nothingness that lies in connection to its being. So ultimately what he's going to say here is that whatever, wherever nothingness comes from, it comes from a being that needs nothingness. Right. And one of the things we recognize in consciousness is that negation is a central feature. Right. The questioner, remember we started with the question, the questioner is the being who creates nothingness. It's very similar movement to Heidegger's in the sense that Dasein is the being whom being is an issue. For Heidegger, we might say that man is the being who negates. Um, and that's what it means to ask a question. So nothingness must be an ontological characteristic of the being which creates it. So that means that when we talk about nothingness, the reality of it is rooted somehow in us, our ontological constitution, let's say. The type of beings we are are the type of beings who negate, which means nothingness lies at our very heart. Um, and also notice that all of the things we do in our life, our projects, our interests, the people we love, the people we hate, our political views, all of these things ultimately involve negation in one way or another. So when we're talking about here about the way in which nothingness is a part of our ontological co characteristics or our ontological constitution, we don't mean it just conceptually. It, it, we mean it existentially. The way in which we exist is fundamentally uh, um, organized around nothingness or negation. Now the questioner, the one who questions, does throw th through a double annihilation because every question is annihilation of both being of non-being and being it always lies somewhere in between right it's trying to figure out it's where we showed the question has affirmation or denial um, or negativity negation a question itself lies in between which means that the only person who can be in between would be a being that has both nothingness and being as a part of its constitution Quote, thus in composing, in imposing a question, a certain negative element is always introduced into the world. We see nothingness making the work iridescent, casting a shimmer over things. Now, what does this mean? It means that for Sartre, human beings are at least one instance of a being that causes nothingness to arise in the world. And importantly, uh, Sartre doesn't, he's mostly concerned with human beings here, but he said he seems to leave it open in the possibility that other beings probably have negation too. Um, and I think you could probably even argue that for some sort of animals, um, there is a sort of negation that has to be taking place in consciousness. But human beings are the ones he's really going to go after here. Now, I just pulled this in here. Human beings act, they have expectations, and they have projects. All of these 
have negation in one way or another. To act is to choose one thing but negate other things. To have an expectation is to hope in one thing but negate other things. Or to have a project and pursue a project is to negate other potential projects. So human beings are an instance in which we nothingness seems to arise. Now, what is negation? And here I think we get something constructive that popped out at me reading this again. Um, I've read this text many times, but this popped out at me this time, so I wanted to emphasize it, which is where he says that negation is the rubric of a category. Now, let me read this. He says, quote, in order for the totality of being to order itself around us as instruments, right? So I'm sitting here and I have the computer in front of me, I have the book, I have my coffee, etc. right? The totality of all these beings are instruments for me, things to use. So in order for it to parcel itself into differentiated complexes, which refer one to another and which can be used, it is necessary that negation rise up, not as a thing among other things, but as the rubric of a category which presides over the arrangement and the redistribution over great masses of beings and things. Quote a little bit later, man or human beings are the being through which nothingness comes into the world, right? Um, so this is very interesting. So that means that the negation is the, is the rubric of a category that allows me to recognize all these different complexes of things. So when you go into the cafe, you're looking for Pierre, I see all these complexes, this is that, this is not that, and so on and so forth. But it oh, sort of as it were in an a priori sense, negation is a category and that allows me to make a meaningful to make to make meaning and even understand what I'm perceiving. So that means that human beings are the being where nothing who are, in which um, nothingness originates. Now this is where things get interesting and exciting, because Sartre says, "What is negation? It's freedom. Freedom isn't the property of the soul, right? Freedom isn't a part of isn't a, a description of our psychology." Rather, freedom is precisely negation. Now, notice in the world, lots of things happen. We'll say in the, in the world of the coffee cup, right? The coffee cup remains cold until I pour hot coffee in it, and then the coffee cup gets hot. I pour the coffee out, or I leave the coffee out, and then the air temperature slowly cools the coffee. Notice the coffee cup has no freedom. It is always determined by whatever takes place around it. And that's true in many ways, according to me, gravity, you know, is organizing and having causal influence on my body and so on and so forth. But notice here that unlike the coffee cup, my ability to have negation in consciousness is by itself not something which can be determined. Why? Because to be determined, because something can't come from nothing and nothing can't come from something, which means that the nothingness that is at the heart of my consciousness of the world is not something that is being caused by something else because other things can't cause nothingness. Being can't cause nothingness. Where does nothingness originate? It originates in me. And this origination reveals my freedom. So the category of freedom for Sartre is somewhat, I don't want to use the term psychological because he's going to resist that. He's going to call it ontological. Um, but... You can say here that that no one can ever take away your freedom so long as you can become you can have negation so long as you can recognize nothingness in the world. So the freedom, or let's put it this way, to talk about to say that human beings are free for start is as it were if we were to peel um, open up the hood, what we would see is the structure of negation as being a central feature in our ontological constitution, the way in which we exist as beings. Because remember, nothingness cannot be a property. Now think here about Husserl's epoch or the phenomenological reduction. Remember, for Husserl, the epoch was when uh, I, I have all these phenomenal experiences and all of these, in, as it were, in the screen of my mind, I have all these perceptions and I ignore their existence and I can parenthesize the fact that there are real objects and treat all of my perceptions as being just phenomena, um, right? This is the way in which you may call it our bracketing procedure and so forth. Notice to bracket or to parenthesize something to have a phenomenological reduction is in fact to negate 
um, features of our experience and our perception. In that, so that's nothingness, right? Um, and so that means, and that reveals freedom, right? He writes, quote, in every way, intentionality and psychological association demands a negation. That is, at the very least, annihilating withdrawal of consciousness in relation to the image apprehended as subjective phenomena in order to posit it precisely as being only a subjective phenomena, right? Freedom is actually the essential feature of consciousness, right? And notice here is that you can arrest, and he, and Sartre says, he says, I know I'm not talking about the type of free, like political freedom here. Obviously you can arrest people and take away their freedom. He's talking about the ontological notion of freedom here. And notice here is that even if you arrest people, you can't take away their consciousness, right? They remain free in mind, if you will. Now, he does raise this question about what about an empty intention? Because, for instance, Sartre, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, Husserl talks about the notion that we can have intentions, we can have empty intentions. So what is an empty intention exactly, right? That would be when I have, I'm conscious of something not being the case. That's an empty intention, right? He writes, quote, an empty intention constitutes itself as empty to the exact extent that it posits its matter as non-existing or absent. In short, an empty intention is a consciousness of negation, which transcends itself toward an object, which it posits as absent or non-absence. And so what this means is that Pierre's absence, in order to be established or realized, always requires a negative moment by which consciousness in the absence of all prior determination constitutes itself as negation. So uh, again, he basically what I think starts doing here is he's kind of tying up loose ends in Husserl's phenomenology uh, to, to not get stuck trying to explain away an empty intention as something. Because what, unlike Husserl, uh, Sartre is trying to argue that negation is fundamental to our constitution as human beings. So, but where is the nothingness of consciousness exactly? And here's Sartre's answer. He says it's between the cleavage, between the immediate psychic past and the present. Now, here I have to admit, I find this somewhat difficult to follow, but it seems to be the case that he gives this example. I have all these preceding experiences in my consciousness. That's my immediate psychic past. But I also have the present at where I decide and I use my intentions and I focus on one thing or another. And it looks like nothingness is the in-between place between that, um, let's call it the previous experiences I've had and the immediate present. But notice here is that what separates the two is precisely nothing, but nothingness is precisely what we're talking about. Now, he says what separates prior from subsequent is exactly nothing. And this nothing is absolutely impassable just because, well, it is nothing. And here I have to admit, I, I sort of had, I'm puzzled by this one a little bit, and I wonder, I wonder if it fully holds. Um, it seems a bit of a sophistry or an equivocation, I think, but this is what he argues. So it's quite interesting, where is the nothingness of consciousness? It's somehow in my ability to not be forced by a predetermined conscious state in the present. That seems to be where nothingness resides, right? Freedom is the human being putting his past out of play by secreting his own nothingness. That's what he says human freedom is, and that seems to be where it is. So where is the nothingness of consciousness? Well, it is in the in-between place between what's come before and what's coming now, right? In my ability to move it about. Um, that seems to be where it is. Now, what does all of this mean? Well, it takes us to a very important concept in existentialism, particularly the existentialism of Sartre, which is the concept of anguish. It's because if freedom is the basis of consciousness, then what is the consciousness of freedom? That is, what does it mean to be aware of our freedom? Because notice here is that if freedom or negation is the basis of consciousness, then that means that if I'm consciousness of if I'm conscious of my freedom, then what I'm doing is I'm negating. Um, something such that my negation becomes available to me. Now, how do we explain this? Think of anguish as the category. And here, Sartre is pulling from Kierkegaard's analysis and discussion of anguish. Kierkegaard distinguishes anguish from fear. Fear is directed 
to other beings. So if I see a large dog jump out at me, I have fear, but the fear is originating because I'm afraid of the relationship I might have with that object that's in the world, the dog. Anguish is different because anguish is when I recognize something. I Anguish is like fear, but fear without an object. Anguish is anguish before myself. So he gives the example, for instance, a new soldier. And remember, starts writing this in the 40s during the Second World War. And we could say here is that, you know, there's lots of new, and unfortunately people are, there's still lots of wars, right? But imagine if you're a new soldier going to war. Obviously, you're afraid of the enemy. You don't want to get killed, right? But many new soldiers are also just afraid of being afraid, right? They're afraid of what they're going to do. They are negating their own freedom, right? Uh, they're negating their own negation. That's what anguish is. Most anguish, though, is probably mixed with fear, but pure anguish, Sartre argues, can arise. Anguish is precisely my consciousness of being my own future in the mode of not being, right? So when the new soldier is on the battlefield or, and they're afraid of how they're going to act because they don't, they've never been in battle before and they're afraid of how they're going to act, they don't want to be afraid, right? Notice here is that they're becoming conscious of the fact that they are free. That when they're in the new battle, they nothing is going to force them, right? All their previous experiences don't invalidate their ability to freely choose to do something else, right? Um, so this is becoming aware of your freedom, and that is best described as an experience of anguish, right? Now, there are different types of anguish. There's anguish in the face of the future, the way that the, the new soldier is worried about, you know, what they're going to face. And there, they're looking at, they ha they're looking to the future and they're not sure how they're going to be free, right? Um, but there's also anguish in the face of the past. And in this example, Sartre gives the notion of a compulsive gambler who's decided to quit gambling, but still keeps gambling, right? Or you can think if you want of a drug addict or anyone who's addicted to something. But so the compulsive gambler right? In this case, the compulsive gambler has made, uh, they know that they're a compulsive gambler, so they've said that they're going to stop gambling, but then there they are at the craps table starting to gamble again, right? And they suddenly have anguish, right? What's going on here? Well, Sartre says, quote, what he apprehends then in anguish is precisely the total inefficacy of the past resolution." The resolution is still there. That is the resolution to stop gambling. But yet I, the gambler, am it in the mode of not being. So it's kind of the reverse here. Now, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but at this point, uh, Sartre does mention here that psychological determinism doesn't invalidate the analysis. Right? It's true that we may have psychological features which are helping to motivate us, as it were. Uh, but this is not going to invalidate the analysis. He writes, quote, it is not because I'm free that my act is not subject to the determination of motives. The structure of motives as ineffective is the condition of my freedoms. And this is the great distinction, I think, which is quite nice here. Motives are not in consciousness. They are for consciousness, right? So we have motives, but the motives are for our consciousness. They aren't in our consciousness. They're not objects of our consciousness, Freedom which manifests itself through anguish is characterized by a constantly renewed obligation to remake the self, which designates free being. Now, this ultimately gets to the problem of essence. Remember, going back to existentialism as a humanism, we say that the major problem, the, the idea of existentialism is that existence precedes essence, right? But what is essence? Essence is the meaning of something. If we want to know what something means, we want to know its essence. And an essence is what's essential to something such that if that being exists, it has to exist with those features, right? So let's like take a look at this quote. Essence is everything in the human being which can indicate, which can be indicated by the words that is. Due to this fact, it is the totality of characteristics which explain the act. But the act is always beyond that essence. Essence is all that hu human reality appreh apprehends in itself as having been, 
it is here that anguish appears as an apprehension of the self. So he has this notion that, remember, that fundamentally what has been, right, all of the previous experiences that I've had are leading up to me. And all everything I would say about the essence of human reality is based upon all of that. But now we have this notion of negation, nothingness, which interrupts that entire fold, uh, that field. Um, and that's where anguish appears. So notice here, it's no wonder that human beings are in anguish over the meaning of their lives. Because we look back on our life and we see all these things that have been, but we realize that they need not be the meaning of who we are. And that could be either good or bad. So notice here, existence really does precede essence, but the existence of human being, of the human being, is fundamentally through this feature of negation. And that means that the essence can change based upon um, how we exist. So in, in one further thing is, so we have this notion of anguish, we have this notion of freedom, but it is also the basis for values. We discover ourselves than in a world that's peopled with demands in the heart of projects. But as soon but as soon the enterprise is held at a distance from me, right? So I'm living in the world, but as soon as I get a little distance and I can just reflect about my role in the world, quote, I discover myself suddenly as the one as the one who gives its meaning to the alarm clock. The one who by a signboard forbids himself to walk on a flower bed. The one who decides the interest of the book which he's writing. I emerge alone and in anguish, confronting the unique and original project which constitutes my being. All the barriers, all the guardrails collapse, annihilated by the consciousness of my freedom. I do not have, nor can I have recourse to any value against the fact that it is I who sustains values in being, right? So, and this is what it is too. Part of anguish is to recognize that your freedom also means that all the things in your life that you feel like are um, forcing you to do one thing or another, if you get some distance from it, you begin to recognize that the meaning of, of all of that is really coming from you. So anguish is also the recognition that your values are in some sense chosen by you or they're a freely determined, let's say, by you. Now, what's the opposite of anguish? Uh, is the anguish he says is opposed to the mind of the serious man who apprehends values in terms of the world and who resides in the re reassuring materialistic substantiation of values. So for instance, a person who's serious about the world and by serious, I think he means someone who's, who's thinking, uh, who's living in the world, but doesn't sees the, the values of things as materially instantiated in them. He says, this is the person who's, doesn't have anguish because they don't recognize their freedom. Um, and we'll, a lot more of that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, psychological determinism. And here, there's a big, long discussion. I'm going to keep it pretty brief just for um, the sake of time here. But he's definitely against psychological determinism. Psychological determinism, right, is the fundamental notion that maybe your, your brain and the experiences you've had uh, are ultimately what is determining your actions, not you, right? That your sense of freedom is just an illusion. It's really just this, this is Freud, right? It's just the psychological um, uh, excitations of energy and so forth that are making you act the way you do. But what he's going to say is that psychological determinism is, first of all, an attitude of excuse, or if you prefer, the basis of all attitudes of excuse. In other words, he thinks that psychological determinism can't overcome this problem of negation because otherwise it has to um, it has to deny negation, but its denial is a negation. But we can also say is that psychological determinism is a way of trying to refuse our freedom. In other words, it's a way of refusing our refusal. Um, it is a flight from freedom. And he thinks that it is natural for us to actually flee when we realize how free we are and we realize that we're the source of all this value and that all the stuff that's happened before is not our essence. It can still be determined by how we exist, right? 
in our, in our recognition and discovery of freedom causes anguish, he says it's natural and we recognize that we flee from this freedom. Quote, thus we flee from anguish by attempting to apprehend ourselves from without as an other or as a thing. So in other words, we try to deny our freedom by turning our own subjectivity into an object, or as it were, the subject objectivizes itself. Quote, he says, I flee in order not to know, but I cannot avoid not knowing that I am fleeing. And the flight from anguish is only a mode of becoming conscious of anguish. Thus, anguish, properly speaking, can neither be hidden nor avoided. Now, that means that the self has this ability to decenter itself, right? I can decenter myself in relation to what I am. And I know I'm this thing that has nothingness at its heart. And I use that nothingness to make sense of all the things in consciousness. And that's what my freedom is. But that freedom is terrifying, right? Um, because I don't know what it means because I'm the one who's responsible. Now, he says that if I try to decenter myself and take myself out of that arrangement, this is what we call an attitude, and it is the attitude of bad faith. And this is going to be the subject of our next video, on, and it's the subject of the second chapter on bad faith. So that concludes our discussion of Sartre's being in nothingness for today. Thank you guys very much for watching. Stay tuned for chapter two coming up next time um, on bad faith. Okay, bye.